I just want to say to you young men, I believe the Bible. I have no apology whatsoever to make for it. Every phase of it and every statement therein found. I believe that the whale swallowed Jonah. And if the Bible had said that Jonah swallowed the whale, I'd believe that. I'd think, however, that he had to let out his belt a few notches, but <clears throat> I'd accept that as a regular statement. And I don't want to hear of any of you going out from Abilene Christian College with a question mark about your loyalty and your fidelity and confidence in the Word of God. I think the Bible was inspired, and I belong to that school who believes in a verbal inspiration of the Bible, because the Bible says so <clears throat> in so many words. Paul declared that to the Thessalonians, when you received the Word of God which was preached unto you, you received it not as the Word of man, but as it is in deed and in truth, the Word of God, not simply the thoughts of God, but the Word of God. And I accept that without any hesitancy whatsoever. <clears throat> now, someone objects to a thing of that kind on the ground that if God inspired the words, then all the writers would have the same style. Well, that doesn't necessarily to follow. The God that I worship is able to vary according to the trend of different individuals. And we can express things in different ways and get the same result. Why, well, just think of a story of a fellow that went up to a country post office and inquired for the mail. He had a letter there the postman handed to him, but he took it and looked at it and he couldn't read it. He went back to the postmaster and asked him to help him. Well, the postmaster said, I don't know anything about these modern languages like English and French and Spanish and so on. All I know is just plain old American language. But he said, I'll do the best I can for you. He took the letter and after 10 or 15 minutes called the fellow and said, well, I think I have this thing worked out. <clears throat> it may be some error, but according to the way I have it, here's what it says. And he read it. Your Uncle James, having become seriously debilitated, both physically and intellectually, and having suffered some financial reverses, in a moment of temporary dementia, <clears throat> he precipitated his own demise. Now he says, that's what it says, but just in plain language, here's what it means. Your Uncle Jim got old, lost his wad, went nuts, and bumped himself off. <laughs> and he had the same result, regardless of the manner in which it was presented. <clears throat> I wanted to talk to you tonight about what I conceive to be very important and a challenge to all of our thinking. This talk that I have in mind was provoked by an old gentleman who raised a question of me a number of years ago. I kind of had the reputation of emphasizing my staying with the Bible and doing things in Bible ways. And he asked of me, if I'm such a stickler for the book, why is it that I don't walk to my appointments or ride a donkey? said the apostles did, and you never heard of their doing anything other than that. Well, I knew there's something wrong somewhere. I hadn't walked very far and I hadn't ridden a donkey, and I said to thinking regarding it, and I'm calling attention right now to things that are bound upon us and things that are loosed, concerning which our judgment must prevail. And just take up the commission as given by Matthew, for instance, and the first statement in it after the preface of all authority having been given, Christ said, Go and teach all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
Peter said in Acts 3.22, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto me like in your brethren. He was quoting Moses. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul that will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from his people. God said, Go. There's a plain positive commandment that I cannot evade, and that's the thing that must be done. And any individual or any church that is not leading with the idea of going or getting the message to the other fellow he is not after the New Testament order. But in going by the way, which is a specific command, why there are things about it that's left to our judgment, I can walk and fulfill what God said, or I can ride. Those are the two methods of transition from one place to the other. Walk or ride. And I can't use either one of them as auxiliary to the others. Why? Well, because they stand as equal and of coordinate relationships. Why, I can't walk as an aid to my riding, and I can't ride as an aid to my walking, because they stand in equal fields. <clears throat> but when God said go, I can do that by riding. And then I subdivide that by riding a mule, as I have done, by riding in a wagon, on a train, in a bus, and in an airplane, in any way that I may elect to carry out God's Word. And when I have gone, regardless of the way in which I have made the travel, I have neither added to God's Word, nor taken from it, nor substituted for it. And hence the going is bound upon us, but the method by which I fulfill that is left to the good judgment and to the sanctified common sense, as some want to put it. Well, that brings in one term that I think is equally necessary for us to understand. That's the matter of expediency. The law of expediency is the adoption of the best way to reach a given end under, as an old fellow said, under the surrounding circumstances by which we're surrounded with. <clears throat> and if you can just get it after that fashion, according to the environment and in harmony with the relation existing, the best way to carry out that which the Lord has suggested is matter of expediency. Hence, I am at liberty to do as I like regarding the carrying out or the execution of God's command to go. And if some fellow said, now, give me an example where they ever went in the Pullman car. Why, well, I'd be up between a rock and a hard place. I couldn't do it. Well, where'd the apostles ever ride by the wheel on an airplane? I really doubt if they had any back there. I'll tell you the facts about it. And of course they didn't go. But that's the hair splitting. And that's the type of reasoning that leads to a hobbyist, to a crank, and to a splitter of churches, and a disturber of the peace and quietude and tranquility of a congregation. So we ought to understand those matters. Well, now, the next thing, God said, go, and then he said, teach. Now, just what does that mean? It means to impart information, to banish the darkness and ignorance, and let the light to shine in. That thing is bound upon the churches. Go, bound upon every individual. Paul said in Hebrews 5:12. Brethren, when for the time that you ought to be teachers, you who, all of you, why, you've fallen down on that. You have become delinquent regarding duty's demand. And therefore, you need to be taught again, which be the very first principles of the oracles of God. I must, therefore, do that which the Lord said or else, subject myself to being cut off. Well, now, again, 
Has the Lord suggested the precise method by which I shall impart information? And just assuming that I had some to impart? Well, of course not. Well, where is the privilege then and the liberty that I have? Well, I can do it either orally, as I'm trying to do now, or I could write it, depict it upon a surface, and transmit it in my absence to the other fellow. Or I could draw diagrams that would carry the thought across, and in so doing, what have you done? Just what the Lord said. Precisely so. Now get it. He has bound upon us the obligation to teach. He has loosed the place where it's done as to whether or not all the churches assemble or whether some of them get over in this room and some over in that room and others back yonder. What are they doing? Just what the Lord said. And the fellow that want to raise fuss about that and suggest, well, that's not scriptural. It is scriptural. It's exactly what the Lord said. You are doing the thing demanded and then exercising the law of expediency, the best way to accomplish and to carry out what the Lord has made obligatory upon us. And thus we have that phase of it. <clears throat> well, the Lord said, go and teach and baptize. What does that mean? As we learned a night or two ago, that means a burial into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and a resurrection to walk in newness of life. Now, that's the thing that must be done in order to obey God's command. But there are a number of things about it that are left to our judgment. For instance, just in what position must a fellow be when he's baptized? Or someone said, Brother Hardin, you've got to take him out of the water just about of a whatness and then fold his hands and lay him backward. How do you know I have? Where does the Bible ever say baptize him backward? Nowhere. Now, if any of you boys get cranky enough <clears throat> and have little enough judgment just to get a thing of that kind and say it's not scripture unless you baptize him backward, why, well, you are out of order altogether. How do to baptize the fellow face foremost be just as good as the other? Well, why? God didn't say in what position the body should be, what posture, when baptized. If you baptize them to the right side or the left side, what have you done? Just what the Lord said. Well, why do we baptize them backward? Well, it's a matter of convenience, and it's expedient, so to do, and we think it more nearly represents the death of Christ because we bury folks, we bury them flat on their backs as a rule, <clears throat> Thus we have it. Well, one time I preached there by Henderson, Tennessee, an old gentleman with holy hairs made the confession, wanted to be baptized down in what we call Forked Deer River. And the waters were up somewhat, been raining, and the bushes along the bank were waving back and forth, and it is pretty swift. We walked out into the river <clears throat> and got just about the right depth, and I had his hands folded, as we generally do, and started to raise my hand and say the thing that his generally said. He said, Brother Hardiman, suppose I just squat. Well, I hadn't been used to a fellow squatting on me. <laughs> I said, no, never mind, I'll take care of you. I was better prepared then, possibly, than I am now, more able. But I've just thought about time and again. Suppose he had just squatted until he was buried. Would that have been all right? Someone said, oh, I just couldn't accept that. Why couldn't you? Now, just what is there about it that's out of order? What does the Bible say? Baptize him. What do you mean by that? Bury him. Where did they ever say bury him longitudinally? Why not bury, bury him, as the boy said, perpendicular? <clears throat> In Westminster Abbey, on the banks of the Thames River, Thames River, niches in the wall are at a high price as a burial place. Whether true or not, when I stood there in that historic building, the guide said that old Sam Johnson, the poet, 
and the writer. He's buried here in the floor, and he's buried standing up. Well, of course, I asked why. Said, well, sir, all the spaces were taken up except one of about 30 inches square. And the folks, knowing his wishes so well, they said that he'd rather be buried there, no doubt, could he speak about it, than anywhere else lying down. So, Samuel Johnson is buried in Westminster Abbey, standing up on his feet, unless he's decayed and fallen down since that time. <laughs> so get that out regarding it. Well, now again, there are some things about baptizing. Just where shall it be done? Well, the Bible says, in water. There went out into John, Jerusalem, and Judea, and all the region round about, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. So, John said, I baptize with water. That's the element. Well, just where must it be? And you know there, folks, that are not dead yet, and some of them not even sick. They have an idea that I want to be baptized in running water. Why? Does the Bible suggest that? I don't know whether you folks ever knew Brother J.D. Tant or not. He's related to Yader Tant. I don't know whether he'd admit it or not, but <clears throat> he was in all candor. He was holding a meeting in West Tennessee, and old Bill Sudbury, as with a tent called him, a man who had a fine family, one of his sons, preacher, Homer Sudbury, down in Louisiana. But one night in the meeting, old Bill Sudbury came forward to make a confession for Bill Tan. He had lain in jail at Alamo, Tennessee, about half his days. But he decided he'd go forward that night. <clears throat> and when Brother Tant took the confession, he asked him when he wanted to be baptized, said, well, a certain time, and I want to be baptized in running water. Brother Tant said, Bill said, Barry, if I baptize you, it'll be up here in Brother Buck Nunn's pond where decent folks have been baptized during this meeting. I don't aim to yield to your whims. And there's no sense in that. I guess I wouldn't have had the courage to say that, but that's Brother Tan. Well, he baptized him where other folks were. Brother John T. Lewis, with whom I've been recently in a meeting in Birmingham, Alabama, or Inslee, telling me about an old fellow that came far to make the confession. And after having so done, said, Brother Lewis, I want to be baptized in the River Jordan. Brother Lewis said, well, fine, just about 8,000 miles. You go ahead. I won't go with you, but I have no objection, whatever. Now, that's cranky. That's the hobbyist. That's the disturber, wherever you find it. Water is the element, and wherever there's enough to do what the Bible says, bury a character, that's sufficient. I held a meeting in Haldeman Avenue, Louisville. Oh, Brother John Markham, a Greek scholar of superior ability. <clears throat> he attended the meeting, but he was terribly opposed to a baptistry, which we had. Well, they had a number of additions, and for several nights I paid no attention to him, but every night he'd come around and say, that's not scriptural. Well, I just passed it by, but one night I decided I'd talk with the member about I said, what's the matter with it? Well, that's an artificial affair in the meeting house, and I'm opposed to it. Well, I kept pinning him down, how much water do you have to have? And so on. And finally got to this point, I said, suppose we dig a vat out in the churchyard, about eight feet long and four feet wide and about the right depth. What does you think about that? I said, that'd be all right. <clears throat> but I said, don't want the meeting house. You accept that? Yes, sir. Well, I said, I'll tell you how to solve it. Let's pick one out there somewhere and then build a meeting house over it. <clears throat> and surely you wouldn't object. He said, yes, I would. 
Why, those are things that are loose to us for the best judgment that we may entertain along lines of that kind. Gold demanded, bound upon us, teach, obligatory, baptize, commanded. Who shall do it? The Bible doesn't say. And I have wondered many times, you know, in these modern days we have our meeting houses heated with furnaces and usually a pipe run through the baptistry. I just wonder, brethren, in order for the baptized to be scriptural, what temperature must the water be? Did you ever thought about it? <clears throat> now, I've baptized people in hot water, out in the mill ponds, tanks, and then I've broken the ice to do it. And there have been some amusing things. I recall more than one instance. We used to sing when we baptized folks in Tennessee, How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord. And one time I remember walking out with a fellow to baptize him in an old pond that had been there for a number of years, and they come and sing How Firm a Foundation, and we were miring up half to our knees, and I thought the most ridiculous thing at all. That song is out of order at this time. My feet are found in miry ground, and Lord lift me up and plant me on firmer ground. <laughs> Would have been more appropriate. <clears throat> so all of that. Well, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do that. But don't become cranky as to where it takes place, nor who does it, nor what kind of weather, nor anything of the sort. Well, after that a man becomes a Christian, then Christ commanded that they eat of the bread and drink of the fruit of the vine. Now, he never commanded that to be done on the first day of the week, and you can't find the Savior your life where anybody's ever commanded to eat the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. Someone said, why, Brother Hardiman? Well, why back at you, by the way? Where is he? <clears throat> now, that just suggests to us there's more than one way of teaching a thing. I would affirm in honorable controversy that the Bible teaches the observance of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. Where's authority? We have an inspired example, and an approved example comes to us with all the force and power of a direct command. Therefore, the Bible teaches by direct command, teaches by approved example, and thus we have it. On the first day of the week, the Lord's Supper, that's binding upon Christians. They ought not to forsake the assembly, like some did back there and some do now. Well, now let's have some other points about it. At what time on the first day of the week shall we observe it? Has the Lord ever said? No. He has bound the first day of the week as the time, but has loosed the precise hour for its observance. And yet I can name you brethren that will withdraw fellowship on matters that may arise as to the time of day. At Malden, Missouri, the old fellows did now, but some years ago if you had gone there on Sunday morning the table would be perfectly blank, not a thing. And of course, you'd look around, well, where's the Lord's Supper? Well, it's not to be found. And what is his idea about it? He said the word supper didn't mean dinner. <laughs> now, you just see the kind he was and where he came from, by the way. At his house, he had breakfast, dinner, and supper. And he said, the Lord's Supper, not the Lord's dinner. And he insisted, and the church yielded. Contrary to what I think they should have done, they had the Lord's Supper at night only. Now, on what ground? On the ground that he said supper didn't mean dinner. And notwithstanding the fact that men who knew something would tell him that referred not to a particular time, but just to a meal, and therefore... 
It wasn't definite as to the time, but that didn't make any difference. When a fellow gets set on a thing and harbors an idea and thinks it's largely original with him, you can't budge him from it. He's fixed, regardless of all things else. Just like I have illustrated time and again, a very <clears throat> fine lady one time was going to invite her friends in for six o'clock tea or dinner. She told the old cook about it. Said, now be here and I'll have the menu prepared and I want you to fix it as I suggest to you and when the ladies come and six o'clock rolls around, you come to the front, open the door and say, ladies, dinner is served. Well, that old black mammy couldn't get it into her head how they're going to have dinner at six o'clock, save her life. But she wanted to carry out instruction. Finally, the dear ladies came. Meal was prepared. She stepped to the living room door and opened it wide and said, Ladies, dinner is served. All of you come out to supper. <clears throat> Why, she couldn't get away from supper to save her life. And just so, if you undertake to determine just the day, or rather the time of the day for the observed the Lord's Supper, you're running into that which will provoke trouble. Now, there's some that won't have it in daytime. That's one example. And Brother John T. Lewis, a kin to Brother John P. Lewis, and one of the best men, men I ever knew, and I think has done more for the cause than any one man that I could name tonight in the city of Birmingham. And yet, he won't let you have the Lord's Supper at night, by the way. So there you are. <clears throat> I don't know when you'd have it unless you'd have it about three o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> or early in the morning. Well, that's <clears throat> matters that I think are wholly unnecessary. And such things are left to the good judgment of brethren and ought to be, of course, of the senior brethren, to be sure. Well, the contribution is obligatory upon church members upon the first day of the week. That's the time when let every one of you, that's the who, not the daddies, for every one of you. Well, how much? According to your ability. On the first day of the week, get it. Well, now, all right. <clears throat> but I just want to raise the point. How are you going to collect it, by the way? Why, someone said, <clears throat> we pass a basket or a receptacle around. Where did the Lord ever say anything like that? Nowhere. Brethren, I'm afraid your new digresses when you begin to pass some kind of receptacle around. And you've gone off after things of the world. Isn't that ridiculous? And then another fellow said, why... All of you come around, I've had them do that, and put it on the table just like the Lord said. <clears throat> and then they run into each other and bump around about faces, and a general mix-up. Well, of course, the Lord never said anything of that kind. How are you going to collect it? Well, the Bible doesn't say. Someone said, I challenge your procedure, and I dare you to say that that's scriptural. What do you mean by being scriptural? I want you to find in the Bible where God ever commanded that or where they practiced that. Well, I couldn't do that. I wouldn't know just where to turn. But the Bible gives general principles, one of which is let all things be done decently and in order. And it's much more orderly and much more in harmony with expedient matters to pass around the receptacle, so to do. I heard of three boys once that were arguing about the greatness of their fathers. One is a doctor's son, one of <coughs> lawyers, and the other a preacher's son. And the first two, the doctors and the lawyer's son, boasted of their daddy's ability and what they could do. Why, the lawyer's son said, I'll tell you. My daddy can get up before the gentlemen of the jury 
women too now, <laughs> and plead a case and draw a salary of a thousand dollars. Well, the doctor's son said, I'll tell you about my daddy. He can put on a white robe and go into the operating room and stay for 30 or 40 minutes and extract some article from a character and then come out with $1,500 a fee for it. Well, the preacher's son is just wondering what on earth could he say. And finally, it dawned upon him. Why, well, I said, brethren, that's nothing. I'll tell you what's the fact. My daddy can get up and preach for 40 minutes and it'll take eight men to gather up the money. <laughs> Why, he didn't have any trouble getting past things of that kind, by the way. Well, those are matters now for good sense and to study. God said to sing with the spirit, with the understanding. And I got a note from a man, possibly still have it as a kind of a relic. He said, Artemis, you claim to go with the Bible. Well, that's exactly right. I did so claim. Now, I want to know what's your authority for some of your crowds singing soprano, and some bass, some alto, and some tenor. Now, that let me out for the minute. I didn't know where God ever said, for a certain one to sing the basso profundi part, or anything of the kind. <laughs> now, what did you say about it? Why, we insist that we ought to sing, the Bible recommends and teaches that. Well, just what part must I sing? Well, of course, you see the point quicker than I did. It matters not what part. You are left, by the way, to your own good judgment along that line. If you sing soprano, what are you doing? What the Lord said. If you sing alto, what are you doing? Just what the Lord said, and so on, all down the line. In 1924, I came out to Texas and held a meeting at Broad Street, the Broadway maybe, in Lubbock, way back yonder. I got in on Saturday afternoon and they parked me at a hotel, and that night some brother, whose name I could not recall, came over to see what they had on hand. Of course, I just think, see what I was up against, as he dare be. And I had just gotten back from Palestine, fresh from that splendid trip. And he came to interrogate me about various matters. And he said, now, Brother Hartman, I teach a Sunday school class, and I'd like for you to help me some on it, and maybe you know some things. Will you tell me the geographical and topographical setting of this lesson? I've forgotten what chapter it was, by the way. I said, yes, I visited that place, <clears throat> and I know something about it. I proceeded to tell him all that I knew. And then I gave him the historic setting, the background, and just how that chapter was sandwiched in between other two thoughts, and did the very best I can. He said, now, I teach a Sunday school class, and I just wanted to learn all this, but said, down where I teach, we don't have literature. I got his numbers, the boys say, right there. I said, well, now, wait a minute. <clears throat> Suppose that I just write out all the details that I've given to you, and then let's mimeograph them and hand every member of your class a copy so they'll get the benefit, if they're being in it, of what I had to say. I said, I'd oppose that. I said, you want to be the high fellow in the class yourself. You want to be one that opposed to no more than the others. It's my remembrance. I may not be correct about it, but the brethren at Broadway built another meeting house about a block away for all of his kind. If not, I think churches would do well at Indianapolis, by the way, the Garfield Heights Church <clears throat> has a place. If a fellow comes in cranky after matters of that kind, Brother W.L. Totty doesn't hesitate to voice the center of the elders by saying, Now, you're an off brand. You don't belong here, but there's a place right down yonder, some two or three blocks away. You go down there and you'll be perfectly at home. 
But you wouldn't be happy up here. I think it's money well spent to build that crowd of meat nows and let them all be by themselves and have the thing out, just as they see fit. Well, <clears throat> there are other things that I might mention, and yet there might be those present who would think that there was something personal about the matter, but there's not whatsoever. The Bible binds upon Christian men and women the care of widows and orphans. I don't have to quote that passage, James 1, 27, and no member of the church denies its application to them. And yet today, churches are bothered. Some of them are stronger terms. They're even pestered because they've been stirred up and have had some declarations along the line unscriptural, this, that, and the other. Now, what does God suggest do? See to the widows and orphans. Pure religion, undefiled before God the Father, is this, to visit. And that word means to go laden with the good things, to help, to serve, to visit the fatherless and widows in their afflictions, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. The Bible binds upon the churches the obligation to care for those that need such. Well, now, does the Bible tell us how that's to be done? No, sir. And some folks say, well, I dare you, therefore, to claim that the procedure you follow is scriptural. I don't even claim it's scriptural. I never have taken that position in my life about it. It's a matter of expediency. How can best that statement and that obligation be carried out? And that's the question to be determined by the senior members, good sense would suggest the seniors, of any congregation. How are you going to carry out the Lord's will? Someone said, well, I have to take them in your home. Where does the Bible say do that? I say, well, I've got some little orphan child. Have you got no widows on your hand? <clears throat> got to care for them just seems same as you have for the orphans, by the way. And then they get out great statistics that there are enough homes wanting babies to take them out of every orphan home in all the land. And we'd love to have some. Yes, what kind do you want? Well, I want a child of a fine background, and I want it to be normal physically and mentally and in fine shape. I'll adopt that sweet little child. Well, here's one that's cross-eyed and freckle-faced and crooked nose and comes from a low family of low breeding. How about it? We don't want that, by the way. Did you ever thought about that when preachers talk that way? The chances are they don't have any. I've observed some of those that write longer and speak louder in these modern times. That's the way to do it. How many of you have in your home? You begin to search, and they're conspicuous by their absence. While the Bible doesn't say along that line, what does good sense suggest? That the present method, segregating, getting them together, under prepared teachers, proper supervision, is the best that human judgment can devise. And it's a matter of expediency. And when they suggest, well, find the scriptures, I don't even look for it. I know it's not there and so on. Now, that will apply to all things along that line. Here you have a college out here of the finest type anywhere, doing a wonderful work, inviting 1,700 pupils and more within its doors. What are you doing? Teaching God's Word along with matters necessary to be known. Well, I'm opposed to it. Why? It's unscriptural. Why is it unscriptural? And by the way, Brother Hartman, will you affirm that the Bible authorized Abilene Christian College? No. I wouldn't affirm that. But I'd affirm that it is a matter of expediency, the very best way 
that I know to carry out what God did say. Now let me tell you folks one thing. Colleges are going to stay in this land regardless of the puny opposition prevalent. Orphan homes will continue on and on. They may be somewhat handicapped, there'll be damage done without a doubt, but they'll continue to exist. There's but one place, ultimately, where all such opposers will go, and that is to object to the church doing anything, everything, except preaching the gospel to the local congregation. They'd be driven to that position because they'd know where else to go, by the way, along lines of that kind. Where is authority in the Bible, for instance, for this splendid edifice here? Did you ever read, young men, of where the apostolic church even either bought, rented, or leased a building in which to meet? Never. Why, there's no such thing as that in the Bible. Well, what is it? It's a matter of expediency. It's good sense to have a meeting house, but the Bible doesn't authorize it. You have a baptistry up here. Does the Bible authorize a baptistry? No, it does not. But it's a matter of convenience and does not violate any principle whatsoever of the Bible. <clears throat> well, think of other things along that line. You're going to have what we call a protracted meeting. Does the Bible tell you to have one? Does it designate when you were to have it, whether in October or whether in July? What do you think about that? Well, who are you going to have to do the preaching? Does God's Word say? No, sir. Well, who lead the singing? The Bible doesn't say. Someone said, well, I want to be scriptural. Well, all right, you get nowhere fast along that line. No, all those matters, the building of a meeting house, the baptistry, the Lord's table, and unleavened bread, all matters of expedient affairs. When we come to eat of the Lord's Supper, what does the Bible say about it? Eat of it. How much must I take, by the way, to be scriptural? Now, I've noticed others and do myself, I just take a little bit of it. Does the Bible say just take a pinch of it or not? And how much of the fruit of the vine must I drink? Not like the Dutchman that read when Christ said, drink you all of it. He turned the whole glass up and down she went. <clears throat> well, the Bible doesn't legislate on matters of that kind. God presumes that folks have some sense. Well, all right, at what age? Now, the Bible authorizes marriage and sanctifies the home. And Christ himself honored it by attending the marriage in Cana. At what age are children to marry? Now, you want to be scriptural about things, and that's a secret matter. Just what's the age when your girl is to marry? Again, who's going to save the ceremony? In fact, where is there any authority for the ceremony? You know there's none in the Bible? Well, what about keeping a record of it? Nothing is said about in the world. Just think along those lines. A multiplicity of matters. Where's the authority for preserving apostolic writings? There is none. Where authority for translating the book of God from one language unto another? No authority whatsoever. Those are examples of good sense that come under the law of expediency, which is the law adopting the best method to reach a certain end under pending conditions and circumstances. Well, <clears throat> I guess that's enough along that line that you get the thought that I have in mind. I intend to give nobody just ground for criticizing my adherence to God's Word. 
I propose to preach the gospel just as it is, regardless of consequences, and to do just what the Lord suggests in the best manner that I think can be had in every place where he is not specified, as I've pointed out so many things that come under that head. But I've talked to you long enough tonight. It certainly is a pleasure to have had this opportunity, and I shall not forget it. And I just trust that regardless of all the disturbance, we may sit steady in the boat, that we may buckle on God's armor and march under the leadership of him who has never yet lost a conflict until finally life's race is run, its battles fought, and its victory is won, when he'll bid us to lay aside our armor, scarred and riven by the plowshares of religious war, and then ultimately all of us who love the Lord may sweep through glory's morning gate and walk in paradise in the eternal home beyond. Thank you very much indeed, all of you. All right, Brother Lee. <clears throat> Thank you, Brother Hardman. We're reluctant to see these meetings come to a close. We're grateful to you for them. In just a minute, Brother Morris, will you come to the stand to lead our closing prayer and to make whatever statement you care to make, please? Uh, before we have this uh, dismissal prayer, I'd like to make this announcement. Brother Cox told me that he has a letter today asking that he recommend someone to preach at a given place. If there is anyone here who is interested or who knows of someone who might fill that place, will you see him after, the, after we're dismissed here this evening? Brother Cox is here.